Portland. Mudslides in the Toodle River Valley are the center of attention tonight, and they are the only things holding back walls of water from Mount St. Helens. If the dams created by the latest mudslides should give way, officials say Longview and Kelso, Washington, downriver, would be covered with water. Good evening. We're reporting tonight from Channel 6 Election Central. Mike Donahue and I, because this is Oregon primary election today, and throughout the evening we'll be bringing you reports on those elections. But as we said, the big story today still is Mount St. Helens. As we indicated, emergency crews are keeping a watchful eye on that mud dam up the Toodle River Valley. It's possible if that dam gives way, the resulting flood could cause even more damage than the previous one, raising the Cowlitz River so high that it would go over its banks into the towns of Longview and Kelso. In fact, as you can see on a map, there are a number of communities that would be affected by the flooding. So far, eight people are known dead and 98 more are missing as a result of the first eruption Monday morning. The towns of Longview and Kelso have a combined population of 50,000 and reporter Ken Wu is standing by live in Kelso where this afternoon there was a meeting of emergency services officials to discuss what to do next. Ken? Well, Jim, we're standing on high ground over the Longview-Kelso area just in case. Uh, we came from the valley floor just a short time ago and the river is high. The river is also very, very warm, about 80 degrees, so the uh, fish kill in the area is expected to be tr tremendous. We haven't talked to marine biologists yet, but that's what they indicate. Uh, latest word into us right now. Two or three survivors have been spotted on the uh, flank of the volcano near what's left of Spirit Lake. Army National Guard search and rescue helicopters have just taken off from Kelso uh, Longview Air Airport to take a look in there and see where they might be and if they can air, uh, air evacuate them out of there. As you mentioned, the latest casualty figures are 8 dead, 98 missing, but those figures may not be accurate, but that's what the state emergency services people are saying. The military people are a little bit skeptical of those figures. The Longview-Kelso area is on standby to evacuate in case the dam on the Toodle River breaks, and we're told it could go any time. People on both sides of the Cowlitz River upstream from the Toodle River have already been told to get out, and it might be a good idea for Longview-Kelso residents to keep some bags packed and be ready to go at any time. There are marked evacuation centers up here uh, all over the area. They're mainly in higher grounds, and they've all, all been posted near street signs, so they're fairly easy to find. People living on the higher ground areas might want to make a late-hour trip to the market for food and supplies just in case. Now, for the volcano area. Here's what it looked like from a National Guard helicopter this afternoon. The weather in the area is severe and changeable, and all aircraft are banned from going in except military search and rescue craft. Our cameraman Mike Slowick was allowed to record these incredible scenes of the volcano area from Governor Dixie Lee Ray's helicopter, which made a survey flight into the Toodle River Valley at about 2.15 this afternoon. As you can see, nothing is left. Everything is mired in mud. Mike, you've uh, sort of said this is kind of our own personal apocalypse. Maybe you can describe better in your own words since you saw some of this stuff. Yes, it is, Ken. Uh, I was up there on Saturday about 12 hours before the volcano erupted, and I have never seen an area as devastating, as devastated as this area was. Everything was wrecked. I saw trees that looked like toothpicks laying down on the side of a mountain. It reminded me of uh, photographs that I've seen of the surface of the moon. Everything was a yellowish-gray cast. I recall seeing, as I was doing cutaways of... Uh, of Governor Ray, I recall seeing her shaking her head uh, as though in disbelief. Uh, I've never seen any area as devastating, uh, as devastated as that area was. Thank you, Mike. As we mentioned, the weather is extremely severe in the area. I was talking to one of the Air National Guard uh, pilots who flew into the area, and he said the weather was so severe, they flew into one valley area, and, and they had what's called a devil wind come out of, uh, come out of the valley floor. And what it did was the helicopter blades were turning one way, and all of a sudden his helicopter, the body of the helicopter, started turning in the other direction. And what saved him was a spotter plane, which was above him, uh, operated by the Army, which told him about the situation and because of his incredible skill, managed to get that helicopter out in uh, time. So just incredible shots up there. Governor Ray, right after that uh, trip over the area, landed back at the Longview-Kelso Airport and talked to us about the area. She stopped short of declaring it a state disaster area, but she did say the White House has been informed and is ready to expedite any aid request. The mountain was, was very quiet and very uh, cooperative while we were there, uh, it was, uh, so it was possible to fly quite close to the mountain itself. As we moved, uh, turned to go from the Spirit Lake area down the, uh, the North Fork, 
uh, it was truly an area of, um, such as all of us have seen the pictures of, uh, of the moonscapes or imaginary scenes of other planets. Uh, the same kind of uh, eerie uh, undulating landscape with evidence of an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, uh, ice and, and rocks that have been blown into the area. So to see the impacts from them, uh, we saw the area where there were quite a few uh, vents, a few of them with uh, steam coming up. We saw one area where there were quite a few logs lying there, some of them burning, and a great deal of steam rising uh, from the uh, literally dozens of miles of uh, what had been last week standing forests uh, leveled, uh, seeing nothing now but the trunks of the trees, the foliage all uh, down underneath and all covered with layers of ash. In some places, the, uh, you think you're uh, in another world until you see uh, the, uh, the, the, the ash uh, outlining parts of roads. Absolutely some incredible sights from that volcano area. Again, it is totally off limits to everybody except military search and rescue helicopters. And again, the latest word, three survivors have been spotted on the north flank of the volcano near the what's left of the Spirit Lake area. Now, earlier in the day, reporter Judy Rooks and cameraman Jim Hamm traveled up to the Castle Rock area and took a look at what's going on there and also checked in on formal evacuation plans for Cowlitz County. Here is their report. The Toodle River empties into the Cowlitz just north of Castle Rock. Both rivers are now clogged with mud and debris. Some Castle Rock homes along the rivers and on nearby flatlands have already been seriously damaged or destroyed by the mud flows. This mobile home near the Cowlitz River was pushed several hundred feet downstream from its original site. And this house was split in two as it was pushed off its foundation by mud. Throughout this neighborhood, homeowners are leaving in anticipation of further flooding. Mel Miller's house was spared the last time. Now he's prepared for worse flooding. I think I can handle a little more of what we got the other day, hopefully. And how'd that come in? Well, it came in kind of slow and steady. You know, the, the mud was so thick that it would just kind of surge and build up pressure behind it and surge a little more. So it wasn't a matter of just sweeping in so fast you couldn't get away from it. In Castle Rock, police want people to remain ready for an evacuation. They've urged that non-essential businesses remain closed, and schools are closed. Police figure Castle Rock will get about an hour and a half notice of a flood. The sirens on the police vehicles will go to a high-low pitch. The officers by bullhorn will notify the people in the low-lying areas. Fire department personnel will also be assisting us at the same time, getting the people to high ground. Police estimate half of Castle Rock's 2,000 citizens have already left their homes. Most are staying with friends who have houses on nearby hills. Authorities are concerned that in the event of a quick evacuation, bridges and roads could become clogged with traffic, and they say that's not really necessary. How do we educate them that we don't need to... Uh, 400 cars stacked up at 30th and Ocean Beach are trying to get through Kelso's construction area when, when we've got hills all around us. But if, they, if we can get them to move in some orderly fashion, and then where are they going to go? At an afternoon meeting with Kelso and Longview officials, Cowlitz County Sheriff Les Nelson suggested they quickly publish a flyer spelling out evacuation procedures. Nelson told those gathered, no one can predict when the new Spirit Lake Dam might break or whether it will break bit by bit or suddenly. But he notes, either way, the floods won't last long. And it isn't an inexhaustible source. It's going to do like the last one did. It's going to come through and do its thing if it comes all at once, and, and then it's going to recede. All along the river valley, the mood is one of tense anticipation. One observer commented, seems like everyone's just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Judy Rooks, Channel 6 News, along the Cowlitz River. Okay, and what's probably going to happen is that authorities will notify all radio and television in the area, so if something happens, uh, you might want to stay tuned to a radio or keep your eye here on Channel 6. Also, they will probably have patrol cars in the area with loudspeakers, uh, Jim and Mike, telling people to move to higher ground. Those evacuation centers have been set up on some of the hilly areas, so if people have uh, a few moments uh, free this afternoon, they might want to check around or call the sheriff's office to find which is the nearest one to their homes, just in case. The geologists tell us that the possibility of a dam break is imminent, whatever that means, it could go any time, I guess. Any questions?
No, Ken, thank you very much. It's, uh, Ken Wu reporting live from Kelso, Washington. And, Michael, we should mention that uh, we're going to try to update that story during our election coverage between 8 and uh, 8.30 tonight. Washington State Transportation Secretary William Bully says his staff has prepared a detour through Oregon in case the Toodle River Bridge over Interstate 5 is washed out. In the event that the bridge is closed, southbound traffic on Interstate 5 will be detoured at Chehalis through Raymond to the coast, south across the Astoria Bridge, back across the Columbia River at Longview with a connection to Interstate 5 at the Longview Interchange. Of course, northbound Interstate 5 traffic would, would follow that same detour in reverse. Mike, east of Mount St. Helens in the small community of Moses Lake, the closure of Interstate 90 has reportedly stranded an estimated 500 persons. By phone this morning, a caller told Channel 6 News that motorists there are sleeping in churches, in restaurants, and on tabletops, and the food supply is dwindling. Several inches of ash is on the streets. Late today, it was reported that a motor caravan accompanied by emergency vehicles was on the way to Moses Lake from the northwest to take stranded travelers to Wenatchee and over Stevens Pass into western Washington. Mike. Of course, the impact of this volcano is more far-reaching than many of us can ever realize. It's clogged commerce, and it may cause massive economic losses. Elliot Ecke has a report on that aspect. Mike, since last night, the Columbia River between Longview and Portland has been closed to commercial traffic. Mud and silt deposits have filled the main river channel. When St. Helens blew, it sent a flood of logs and mud down the Toodle River, into the Cowlitz River, and finally into the Columbia, the northwest major waterway. Tons of silt filled the 40-foot deep main channel, and now only those vessels with drafts less than 13 feet can pass. Between Portland and Longview, more than 30 ocean-going ships remain at dock, 24 in Portland and Vancouver. 20 other ships destined to arrive this week are being delayed and diverted. Already, dredges are working feverishly, trying to cut through the shoal, estimated at about two miles long. Dredges from Coos Bay and Eureka, California, are on their way to join the effort, and by Friday, five rigs should be working. Well, hopefully, with the resources, we can get in there immediately, the, in the three hopper dredges, we can get this opened up to about a 25-foot depth within about a week. This is based on not getting any more material on top of what we already have. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen up there on the upper Toodle. There are some problems up there that really are unknown to us at the moment. As Heinemann said, it depends on what happens to the mountain and to the mud dam, which is expected to go at any moment, compounding the problem. For the present, he says, 10 million yards of silt will have to be dredged before full passage can be restored. So the ships remain in port. Many are prepared to leave, but can't, and just sitting there costs owners anywhere from $5,000 to $15,000 a day. Already, some shippers who enter the Port of Portland are taking their business elsewhere, Seattle, Astoria, and California ports. That could translate to bad economic news for the port, but it's still too early to tell. Well, about one out of every ten jobs in the metropolitan area are related to port activity. Uh, I, I would be a little reluctant to say exactly how many, but you're looking at probably uh, three to 4,000 jobs directly, and then all the kind of related jobs that are associated with the movement of cargo in and out of the harbor. Anderson said his staff has not had time to assess fully the impact of the catastrophe, but shippers, receivers, handlers, and many more are among those affected. Big port customers, such as foreign automakers, are not expected to sit and wait for the river to reopen and for the mountain to settle. Anderson admits many shippers are making plans to use other facilities if they haven't already, and some have already contracted trucking firms to move containers to other ports to be loaded for exportation. Anderson said Portland may lose some of its worldwide business, but he says the final result will not be the demise of the Port of Portland. There's a lot of catastrophes occur in all over the world, and, and those catastrophes are dealt with. The, the ports are put back into operation, and, and things go back into, into uh, normal production. You have huge floods, you have other kinds of damages taking place, so I wouldn't look at this as the end of the world. But there's no getting around it. Some jobs will be lost, at least temporarily, and the price of some consumer goods will go up because of the extra handling charges. Elliot, as I understand it, those uh, large ocean-going vessels require 25 feet or more of draft. Uh, what will help them? Many require about 39 to 40 feet, Mike, and they're hoping that at high tide and uh, with the regular runoff they, and with the ships unloaded, they can move them out of the port. As far as moving them in, they hope to have that cleared early enough and deep enough so that they can start moving some of the other customers in. Right now, there is 
expect somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred twenty million dollars worth of grain tied up in oregon ports along the river also there are oil tankers waiting outside there are all kinds of commodities sitting on the port docks waiting to be shipped and no one can move and it's just a wait and see situation and again it depends on that mud dam up on uh, mount st helens other types of businesses are suffering as well. Elliot Crown Zellerback Corporation today shut down its plant in Wana, Oregon, its paper mill there, because of the Mount St. Helens volcano. The plant is located between the mountain and Astoria. It gets its water from the Columbia River, and officials say the so much debris is in the water now, it's damaging the paper processing equipment. The weather has a great deal to do with Mount St. Helens. It all depends on which way the winds blow. Right now, they're coming from the southwest, and that's good for the Portland area. Dr. John Walls is standing by in the newsroom. He'll have the weather right after this. A change in the local weather coming up tonight. Lower clouds coming in from the northwest will bring some light rain along. Cooler temperatures we had in the high 70s through the Willamette Valley today. Not near so warm tomorrow. We are looking at the winds, however, coming in from the southwest, not the northwest. Not much change, really, from the uh, time that the mountain erupted on Sunday. The upper air pattern at about 20,000 feet still shows that flow from the southwest. The whole pattern has shifted to the east somewhat, but now they flow more up towards the northwestern corner of Montana and then coming down across the midsection of the country and flowing back up into the New England area. We do have a satellite picture from Sunday we wanted to show you, taken within the first hour after the eruption. Uh, this picture from about 400 miles shows, of course, Mount St. Helens right there, and that large plume, even within the hour, beginning to drift east with the westerly winds. Now, Portland area is about here. We see a lot of the high cloudiness around the area. Now, that was estimated about 25,000 feet. So already, by this time, that plume is broken up through that 25,000 foot cloud. That's a shadow from the early morning sun, a very big cloud, a very big plume already at this time. Of course, from our area now, with the wind pattern we just showed you, we'll drift that ash downstream in this matter to the south and then back to the new, uh, new England area. The same pattern will bring the storms down from the northwest and bring our clouds in uh, later tomorrow, and definitely a cloud and cooler day tomorrow. Jim, we'll look more at the local weather when we come back. Thank you, John. Eason, of course, continues to dig its way out from under the ass, which has fallen in considerable amounts since Sunday morning's eruption. Yakima put all of its heavy equipment into the cleanup effort and asked for more. Seattle responded to the request by sending a convoy of trucks and street sweepers over the Cascade to help out. Even so, to the crews facing the task of clearing the streets of dust, the job appeared endless. Face masks were part of the uniform of the day. Ash still fell on much of the state. In addition, the cleanup work, whether by mechanical sweepers or by hand brooms, sent more dust into the air, making it uncomfortable to breathe. Many highways are still closed. An estimated 2,000 motorists were trapped in Ritzville this morning by six inches of drifting ash. Some trucks are being permitted around roadblocks because they are carrying food needed in towns along the roads. But for the most part, law enforcement officers are requesting motorists in Washington state to stay where they are, stay out of the dust, stay indoors. Ma'am? Pardon? No, I can't allow that either at this point. Yeah, you go at your own risk, you're endangering other people also, which is the problem. What's wrong with that? There's, oh, there's six inches to a yeah, foot of ash in Ritzville. Yeah. Local traffic. Yeah. But uh, that's all. I can't tell you. It's close from this point. As you may recall, the governors of Idaho and Montana yesterday declared states of emergency in their states because of that giant ash cloud as it began to drift over. Tons of the gritty stuff fell to earth in Montana. Gary Shepard has this report from there. This city of 60,000, some 450 miles east of Mount St. Helens, remains under a state of emergency because of the volcanic ash fallout. Compared to some other places, Missoula received only a light dose of dust, an eighth of an inch, but it was enough to close schools and all non-essential businesses. The speed limit on streets has been cut to 15 miles an hour to reduce airborne dust levels, and residents have been told to remain indoors because of the health danger from breathing it in. Air pollution levels here last night were measured at more than 19,000 micrograms of dust per cubic meter, compared to a normal level of 75 micrograms. The thing we're most concerned about now is the uh, long-term health effects of uh, some of the high exposures we've had. Okay, what are those possible health effects? Oh, uh, diseases like silicosis, emphysema. We did have uh, one lady who uh, had to be taken off in an ambulance after walking about seven blocks. Uh, what's the most serious problem that you're facing right now? Serious problem is what to do with the ash. Yet, uh, I'm getting it worse now, and we're, uh, we're kind of curious how we're going to get rid of all this stuff. 
Scores of trailer trucks, many with perishable cargoes, are stuck here because highways in and out of town have been closed. Ironically, some tourists were caught by the volcanic fallout. We just came here to get a vacation and get some fresh air, but we came here at the wrong time. Get some fresh air? Yeah, and then look what happens. It's worse than L.A. The volcanic ash has stopped falling now, and the cleanup is underway. But officials here say it will be a year or two before this city completely recovers. Gary Shepard, CBS News, Missoula, Montana. Water quality in the areas immediately around Mount St. Helens apparently have not been affected that much by the ash falls, surprisingly. Dissolved oxygen levels in all of the tested waters, including some rivers in eastern Washington, read about normal 25 hours after that uh, first major eruption. Scientists are experimenting, however, to determine the effect of future ash falls on water quality. Mike, those clouds of volcanic ash and dust indeed are causing problems north and east of the mountain. Problems for breathing and problems for the movement of motor vehicle traffic. And those problems are carried by the wind. So far, the four-county metro area has been a spectator to what may become known as the spectacle of the century. Will Portland ever be on the receiving end, though, of the environmental misery now plaguing communities north and east of Mount St. Helens? Well, the answer is in the winds aloft northeasterlies to be specific. Meteorologists indicate that on the average there are 10 days out of every 365 in Portland wherein the winds are out of the northeast. The last time that happened was last January during the ice storms. It is possible that the Portland area could fall into the volcanic ash cloud, but not likely. To affect the city, the smoke and ash would have to find its way into the Columbia Gorge and be pushed from the east. A northerly flow would deposit ash on the Oregon Cascades, possibly into the Bull Run watershed. That is a concern, but again, say the experts, not a likelihood. Winds out of the northeast generally signal some of Oregon's best weather. In this case, that wouldn't be the case. Meteorologists report that no wind shift is expected through the coming weekend. And Earth scientists say they have absolutely no way of telling how long the mountain will continue pumping ash into our atmosphere. Portland State University geologist Dr. Leonard Palmer says it could last 20 days or 20 years. The power of Mount St. Helens eruption forced a Hughes Air West DC-9 to make an unscheduled landing on Sunday. An airline spokesman says the plane was able to continue following an oil change and the replacement of three windshields. The DC-9 was inadvertently flown into that cloud of ash. The Federal Aviation Administration has issued warnings to pilots throughout the West as a result of that incident. Washington's Water Power Company is in the process of dusting off its equipment covered with ash, and because of it, a number of areas are going to be without power. A spokesman for the company, the equipment has been covered with the powdery volcanic ash, and it has to be removed before the rains come. He says he cannot be sure where or for how long those outages will occur. Cars and trucks do not run very well when there is ash in the air. The material from Mount St. Helens clogs air filters and carburetors. That's why they're keeping the highways closed. Washington State Patrol is keeping its fleet running in the ash-fouled eastern part of Washington State with vacuum cleaners. Periodically, that ash must be vacuumed out to keep the cars running. 600 cars, according to the State Patrol. And over in Idaho, auto parts stores are running out of air filters. More stories on Mount St. Helens yet to come. One of them deals with emergency services. A lot of people are confused over the right telephone number to call regarding missing persons. And a look at what is or is not covered by insurance. We'll be right back. Among a score of other items, Mount St. Helens is also affecting the telephone company. Kim Kern of Pacific Northwest Bell says long-distance telephone circuits in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho are overloaded. He said the company is experiencing a record number of calls into and out of those affected areas. And he said callers will experience busy signals from the overloaded equipment. And there's still a lot of confusion about how to get information about missing persons and which properties those search and rescue personnel have spotted in their helicopter travels. Kimberly Kohler has just returned from a late afternoon news conference. First, Mike, I'd like to talk about a more human story about what it's been like trying to get information about lost friends and relatives. B and Barry Johnson were driving on Highway 504 from Tootle, heading toward a logging road on Sunday where they planned to meet a friend, Jim Fitzgerald of Moscow, Idaho. Before they could meet Fitzgerald, they saw the devastating explosion. It wasn't that awesome until we went around the next corner and from the time from, let's say, just a, 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 a couple of, you know, just a little while. It is ominous, and it's it's right there. And we, we came to a screeching halt, turned the Jeep around, and we drove away at like 85 miles an hour with this gaseous ball just 
almost engulfing us. Did you smell it? Couldn't smell it, couldn't hear it, could see it coming. The Johnsons never found Fitzgerald. They've tried calling the sheriff's offices, but no one has seen his car. Then another friend in Idaho saw some television film of what looked like Fitzgerald's car. The Johnsons vainly searched through our tape and film stock, but couldn't locate the picture. I traced it to a Seattle station. The Fitzgeralds are continuing their search. There is, as of yet, no central phone number for concerned friends and relatives to get information. The State Department of Emergency Services gave me the Central Forest Service number. People answering that number say they don't know which people, if any, have been rescued or who might have been seen from the air. The Forest Service recommends people call the local chapter of the Red Cross. They're supposed to have updated information or keep trying to get through to the Sheriff's Department's phone numbers. A meeting this afternoon is supposed to set up a search and rescue coordination center with a phone number close to the air operation. At the 3 p.m. press conference, a geologist said the south flank of the mountain looks okay. And the results in terms of the south side of Mount St. Helens, uh, we circled it at, at several altitudes a mile or so away from the volcano, and we saw no indication of any problems in terms of things that we could see. No fractures, no displacements, nothing that seemed to be changed in any sort of dramatic way that would affect the stability of the south side of the volcano. Jim Underwegner of the U.S. Forest Service says it will probably be a week before firefighters can get in. He explains one recent sighting of a vehicle trapped in the flow. But in the south fork of the Toodle, a pickup was seen with a door open and a trail bike alongside, there were no people observed right in the immediate vicinity. And that's the only information we have. Some bits and pieces that we picked up at the press conference, geologists spent the morning in the air and never got a view of the 18-mile-long pumice and mud dam that's built up from Spirit Lake to Camp Baker. Smoke from smoldering trees has made visibility only a few hundred feet. North of Fawn Lake, geologists did see three or four vehicles. Two bodies once identified could not be located again by searchers. And the temperature of the pyroclastic flow about two feet down from the surface was nearly 300 degrees Fahrenheit. That measurement was taken near the south fork of Coldwater Creek. Jim? All travel in eastern Washington remains restricted, of course, today. The airport in Spokane is still closed down, as are those in Pasco and Yakima. All three are expected to remain closed at least through tomorrow. Greyhound bus lines report travel to eastern Washington is also shut down, and if we could have gotten through to Amtrak, we could tell you something about the train service. Jim, we're going to switch live now to Bill Diaz, who is in Longview, Washington, with some information on rescue missions. Bill? Mike, while Governor Ray was flying around that volcano, we took Telecopter 6 up to get an idea of what the area looks like that might be hit by that potential flood. From the air, it is much easier to understand why authorities are concerned. Signs of Sunday's flooding are evident everywhere along the Cowlitz River near Castle Rock. And if a massive flood occurs, it will push waters into low-lying areas that have not yet been affected. Road crews at the Interstate 5 bridge that spans the Toodle are in constant touch with state patrol. If that dam upriver breaks, authorities feel this site would have 30 minutes warning before the floods hit again. Sufficient time to clear the area if they are alert. Roadblocks are back up near I-5 at the 504 exit. Only press and property owners have been allowed into the Silver Lake area. The region from the Silver Lake roadblock to Toodle has been completely <laughs> evacuated. The Toodle has been rising slowly all day amid reports that water has been seen spilling over that Camp Baker area dam of earth and logs. And the rising water is feeding this lake just off the I-5 freeway north of the 504 exit. We're in the Castle Rock area, many miles from the volcano, yet the waters in this lake are warm warm enough to kill the fish inside. Authorities fear this new warm water lake will add to flood problems near the town of Castle Rock. Meanwhile, the mountain maintains its fitful vigil over the valleys amid plans to evacuate much of the area if the flooding should occur. Incidentally, now that uh, Toodle has been evacuated, the National Guard has had to move its emergency evacuation center to the Kelso Airport, and that's where they're coordinating all the activity of getting the survivors out, and we're going to get more word on those three survivors as soon as it comes in to us. We're checking on it right now, Mike. Thank you, Bill. Bill D is reporting live from Longview.
Coming up, the other major news story of the day, Oregon's primary election, which is why we are here. We'll be right back. Voter turnout is low to moderate in Oregon voting today. The presidential primary, at least, doesn't seem to be drawing the electorate to the polls in great numbers. Political reporter Floyd Smith is with us now with some late figures. Floyd? Jim, uh, Secretary of State Norma Paulus told me this afternoon she is confident in her earlier prediction of a 59% voter turnout statewide. She said uh, there was a flurry of voting this morning that leveled off this afternoon. Oregon's elections director, Ray Phelps, who works for the Secretary of State, said the 59% prediction looks good, but it could even go higher. Still, says Phelps, the projected figure would be the lowest turnout for a presidential primary since 1960, but very close to the 61% turnout four years ago. The soft voter interest is indicative of unexciting candidates and issues, and indeed many voters have stated they believe the choice between presidential contenders to be no choice at all. President Carter is favored to win the Democratic primary, Reagan the Republican. In statewide races, perhaps most attention has been focused on the Democratic nomination for treasurer between Multnomah County Auditor Jewel Lansing and State Senate President Jason Bow. Also, the Democratic field running for Attorney General has drawn some interest for seemingly well-qualified candidates in that race. Statewide ballot measures have drawn little discussion. Most are uh, considered uh, housekeeping issues. Local measures could be expected to uh, generate more enthusiasm. In Portland, for example, a water fluoridation repealer appears on the ballot. Also in Portland, the mayor's office is up uh, for grabs. Uh, that race uh, is not likely to be ignored by voters. There are a few hotly contested legislative races uh, and one congressional race uh, that is predicted to be close, uh, that for the Democratic nomination for the third district between incumbent Bob Duncan and uh, his challenger Ron White, and that in the uh, Democratic side. Of course, uh, we'll have uh, coverage of uh, these and other issues through the evening, Jim. That begins at 8 o'clock tonight. Thank you, Floyd. The Bonneville Power Administration announced that wholesale rates for federal electricity in the Northwest will go up by 50% in 1981 if regulatory agencies approve. BPA officials said the increase is necessary because of inflation and delays in construction of nuclear power plants. Mike? Teenage prostitution is a problem across the nation. We here in Portland are fortunate the problem is not a major one yet. In part two of the special assignment on teenage prostitution, Wendy Gordon and cameraman Maury Dalla tonight examine how youngsters are recruited. Each year, about a million teenagers run away from home. Often they're throwaways, unwanted by their parents. Sometimes they're caught up in a dramatic divorce. Some of them just simply want to exercise their freedom. Many of them end up here, on the streets. And because they're often unskilled and uneducated, prostitution may seem like the only way out. To find out just how teenage prostitution works, we took a young decoy to an area in downtown Portland known as the camp. It's a gathering place for teenagers, and police claim it's also a pickup spot for juvenile prostitutes, both male and female. It didn't take long for our decoy to be contacted. Though the approaches varied, the intent was the same. She claims he suggested they travel together and he would provide her with business. Remember, all this took place during rush hour in downtown Portland. Portland is a city that happens to be on a pipeline. And it's hard to say that because we might not have obvious pimps in Portland, that somebody out of Portland doesn't end up in Seattle where you don't have to do anything but walk down one of the particular avenues to see a lot of pimping going on and a whole lot of young men and women that are under 17, obviously. It's been alleged that teen prostitutes are recruited in the city schools, something which school officials deny. We really don't get that many complaints regarding pimping or prostitution uh, around the schools. We get a lot of complaints about uh, older um, people loitering around the schools in their cars, and a lot of people feel that they perhaps may be involved in such activities, but uh, it's difficult to establish if they are or not. Again, we sent our decoy out, this time to three Portland high schools that had been identified by police as potential spots for recruitment. 
we spent two afternoons on the campus at grand high our decoy was not approached at jefferson high school the same thing but at both campuses she did find a lot of drug activity authorities say that drugs and prostitution are often linked finally we traveled to adams high school where our decoy was approached by a young man who claimed to be a student he approached me and asked me what type of if i knew what type of person he was and who i was associating with and he said his nickname that he was a pimp and uh, that he likes to he has a lot of women and he has to get his roll out which from my understanding was that he had a bunch of ladies and they'd uh, go out on the street and make money for him and uh, he was talking about being a businessman and doing that and if I wanted to join up that it wouldn't all be fun and games but yet we would it would be a business proposition but there'd be a little fun in it too tomorrow on part three we'll take a look at some of the causes of teenage prostitution and how you deal with them part three goes tomorrow night at five o'clock turning to the subject of the weather dr john walls says that volcanic ash cloud is over lansing michigan or at least it was late this afternoon he'll have weather details on a very warm day in the metro area right after this The most significant changes in our weather over the next 24 hours will be cloudy conditions coming in, cooler weather, the rain not so significant because there's not going to be that much of it. They've had quite a bit on the Washington coast, over an inch up on the north Washington coast, but more just a brief light rain during the night and a few showers tomorrow. We had a few sprinkles around early this morning, but didn't do much. We had 76 for a high here in Portland so far anyway. We certainly would have had a lot higher than that if we didn't have the clouds that were around most of the day. The front is coming down from the northwest. We show it almost on us. It's probably a little slower than that, moving very slow to the southeast, actually growing weaker as it comes down, but the barometer is still falling. As it goes by, the clouds will come in rapidly and a little light rain at times during the night. Then behind it, cooler weather and a shower or two tomorrow, but the sun will be out at times also. We've mentioned that 76 for the current and it's also the highest temperature so far today. The satellite picture shows very little out of this, but we go back five days and look what led up to it by putting a series of satellite pictures together. Starting last Friday morning, we'll see a couple things happen. We'll first of all see that patch of clouds right there move across, and that was what was on us on Sunday when the volcano went off and didn't get, didn't get out and get a good view. A second front coming along will provide uh, some light rain to our area later on tonight. Here we go, five days of weather in a very short time as things move rather rapidly through. There comes that cloud mass that was here Sunday, and then the next front coming down right now, and it kind of thins out very rapidly as it approaches us to the point where it is right now. You see there's not much with it, but enough cloudiness that will cause uh, the sun to be obscured most of the day tomorrow anyway. Down south, the temperature's interior very warm. They had 98 degrees at Red Bluff, California, but only 67 at San Francisco. It was 62 in Los Angeles so far anyway. 98 degrees out at Bakersfield. The western part of the country, really nice and warm weather, high temperature, or high pressure through most of the area, and high temperatures. Phoenix, 104 this afternoon. It was 86 in Albuquerque, 75 in Denver. And as far north as Great Falls, Montana, 86 degrees this afternoon. We do have a portion in the middle section of the country causing some severe weather there. The drier air colliding with the warm moist air from the southeast, setting off a lot of storm, thunderstorms in west Texas, 83 this afternoon at Lubbock. To the east, the storm moving finally out in the Atlantic, but still causing a lot of thunderstorms along the Carolinas and in Florida. A few temperatures, 89 at Tallahassee, a 74 at Charlotte, North Carolina, 71 in Pittsburgh, and 70 in New York City. Low temperatures here in the Pacific Northwest, 52 locally early this morning, but down to 43 at Salem and 40 at Eugene, 40s along the coast, east of the mountains, mainly the low 40, some cooler spots, Redmond at 40, for example. High temperatures this afternoon, our 76 was even warmer down at uh, Eugene, 78, and made 87 at Medford, the coastal temperatures in the 60s, east of the mountains with plenty of sunshine and some volcanic, a volcanic ash, of course, in eastern uh, Washington, still temperatures were in the low 80s in many places. At 5 o'clock tonight at the airport, the high thin clouds, a partly cloudy condition is generally, it's 24 degrees Celsius, the winds from the northwest at 10 miles per hour, 29.87 and falling, that's the barometer, 45% relative humidity and 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Tonight, the low clouds will be with us before midnight, a little light rain at times, but don't count on too much. Low temperature around 53, tomorrow generally cloudy day and a chance of a brief shower or two and then some bright spots in between the showers. High temperature, a cooler 68 degrees. East of the mountains, it'll still be fair, some variable high cloudiness tomorrow. In the Cascades, increasing clouds, north portion, showers uh, in the uh, north portion is also tomorrow in fair conditions south. On the coast, light rain tonight, occasional showers, southwestern 
Washington, light rain turning to occasional showers with highs around 70. The Willamette Valley, increasing clouds, light rain, not much, uh, particularly close to the Columbia. And for the Portland-Vancouver area, we'll see plenty of clouds tomorrow, brief rain tonight, and some sunshine between the brief shower. Don't get on too much rain, but it's going to be cooler. And we'll take a look at the weather later on. Thank you, John. Good weather for the final round today of Oregon's Boys High School Golf Tournament. Rick Metzger will have the winner of that event and other sports news when we return. The State AAA Boys Golf Tournament concluded this afternoon at the Glendevere Course. The championship trophies carry the name Holes Gang and Medford. Bill Schwanbeck caught up with the chips, the drives, and the putts. He even caught up with the winner. With a blazing 67 today, Mark Holzgang of Beaverton High came from way back to win the State Boys title. Mark started the day seven shots behind the leader, Tony Joyner, but with a 34 on the backside and a sizzling 33 in the final nine holes, he won the tourney by a single shot. Well, last year I was shot 77 the first day and I shot 70 the second. I was just two shots back, so I knew I could do something today. I usually put it on the second day. Is this your best round of golf ever? Yeah, it is. Saved it for a good time. Yeah, I, I'll take it. <laughs> well, there was a two-way tie for second place. At 144 was Todd Henney of Hood River and Tony Joyner of Medford. Tony fired an even par 74 today. Here on 18, he misses a chance at birdie. His Medford team, though, took the team title as it edged out the fast charge in Beaverton squad by two shots. And two shots behind the leader were Mike Roscoff of Beaverton and Eric Johnson of Churchill. Here on the next to last hole, Johnson three putts for Boogie, and that was a killer. Moments later, Hull's gang knew he'd won the crown. His Beaverton teammates were quite proud of the fact that the state winner came from their school. Once again, a 67 today for Mark Hull's gang. Bill Schwambeck, Channel 6 Sports. The Italian Olympic Committee today voted to attend the Moscow Summer Games in July despite objections by the Roman government. That brings to 39 the number of countries that say they will attend, 41 will not, and a number have yet to decide. Decision time has been reached in Colorado. Today, the NHL Colorado Rockies fired head coach Don Cherry. The reason? Well, his club only won 19 and lost 48. The New York Islanders are just one win away from their first Stanley Cup. Last night, the Islanders bombed the Philadelphia Flyers. The final was 5-2. They lead that series three games to one. Let's pick up action in the third period. The Islanders nursing a 2-1 lead when Brian Trottier scored. It was now 3-1. The Flyers, though, fought back. Ken Lentzman did the trick, putting the puck just out of reach of goalkeeper Billy Smith. New York put it away, though, just 90 seconds later. Bob Bourne skates in, freezes the goaltender. The pass to Bobby Nystrom for the tally and a 4-1 lead. The final goal came compliments of Clark Gillies as the Islanders wrap up a 5-2 win. They lead that series three games to one. The Portland Beavers return to action tonight at Civic Stadium against Hawaii. Game time is set for 7.30. Two games have been completed in the major leagues, one in each circuit. In the National League, Phil Necro tossed a six-hitter this afternoon as Atlanta edged Montreal 1-0. And over in the American League, in the first game of a twilight doubleheader, it was Cleveland 4 and Baltimore nothing. Apparently, the Pimlico stewards' decision to disallow a foul claim in Saturday's Preakness was not enough for the owners of Kentucky Derby winning Philly. Genuine risk that has now been appealed. Looking at highlights of that race on Saturday, genuine risk on the outside charging down the stretch and Codex with Jackie Angel Cordero aboard. It occurred during the time when both horses were making an all-out effort. Slow motion replay of the race shows contact between the two horses and possibly Cordero striking the filly with the whip. Jacinto Vasquez, aboard Genuine Risk, believes it was a foul, and as you might expect, Michael, Cordero says no. A decision on that should be reached, however, in a few days, and we'll see what happens. Nothing new in terms of developments in the Major League Baseball? No, sir. they will be meeting again tomorrow to try to ward off that strike, but right now, Michael, uh, maybe imminence too strong of a word, but it's looking very, very uh, strongly like there will be a baseball strike. Uh, it will not, I understand, affect the Pacific Coast League, however. Scheduled for Thursday. Coming up, motion pictures of a volcano and its destruction. I'm sure you'll want to stay with us. We'll be right back. Aside from reporters, many of those who have seen the devastation caused by Mount St. Helens these last few days have been left speechless. The pictures our crews have been sending back are nothing less than incredible. Here's a longer look.
And the story continues as we watch that giant dam in the new Spirit Lake and what it may do. That's our report for now. We'll be back at 8 o'clock as the returns come in from the Oregon primary reporting the winners and losers. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you later.